Good afternoon and welcome to CCK Live and happy Halloween. My name is Jenna Zellmer. Joining me today are Emma Peterson and Courtney Ross. And today we're going to be talking about heart conditions and other related cardiovascular conditions. Um, as always, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comment box below. We'll do our best to answer them. And we'll also be posting links to additional information that can be found on our website at cck-law.com. So uh, let's get right into it. Uh, nearly 1 million veterans have service-connected cardiovascular conditions. So, um, you know, this is a very timely and relevant topic. Um, I would say that they're most commonly rated at 10%. And so um, even though they're not always the most uh, compensable rated, uh, disabilities, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not important. So, um, Emma, can you talk to us a little bit about what the most common cardiovascular conditions veterans can um, have and get service guided for? Sure. So, one of the uh, big ones that we talk about a lot, not just in the context of diseases in general, but Agent Orange presumptions, is coronary artery disease, um, also known as ischemic heart disease. Um, so a lot of veterans who were exposed to herbicides um, ended up developing this disease and can get that presumptively service connection. Um, but a lot of veterans just end up developing CAD <clears throat> later in life, either again due to service or due to other conditions that are service connected. And the other very common one um, that we see a lot of is hypertension. Um, so both of those are probably the two most common heart conditions that we see um, with our clients. Great. And, um, you know, first we're going to talk a little bit about different ways to get service connected for these cardiovascular conditions, and then we'll go into the ratings. But um, we have a lot of information on our website, and I'm sure we've done several Facebook Lives um, in the past about second about direct service connection. But, Courtney, do you just want to give us a quick refresher on how a veteran can get direct service connection for a heart condition? Yep, absolutely. So you'll need a diagnosed heart condition. Um, and then you'll need an in-service event or illness. So it could be what Emma suggested, um, exposure to herbicides in service, or it could be that you actually had an onset of symptoms of your heart condition in service. Um, and then you'll need a medical nexus, so a, likely a medical opinion linking your currently diagnosed heart condition to that event or illness in service. Great, and um, I think that this is a good time to kind of delve in a little bit more into that Agent Orange presumption that you both discussed. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we have direct service connection where you can use that um, that three-step process and get a nexus, but under the Agent Orange presumption, um, there's an easier way to get service connection, at least for CAD right now. Mm -hmm. Is that right, Emma? Yes, so for CAD-ischemic heart disease, um, if you can show that you were exposed to an herbicide, whether it be in Vietnam, <clears throat> um, Thailand, um, or now for our Blue Water veterans um, with the new legislation, if you can show that you were exposed to an herbicide and you have a current diagnosis, you don't need that nexus evidence. It's going to be presumptively service connected. Um, so that eliminates part of the burden in terms of getting service connection. Mm -hmm. And I think um, the VA has different time periods during which, you know, it's already uh, established that Agent Orange was, was used in those different areas. So the DMZ, um, Vietnam, and Blue Water, et cetera. And so, um, you, so to the extent that you, you mentioned, if you can show, a lot mm -hmm. of times just by serving in those um, areas, that has been enough to demonstrate that you were exposed to Agent Orange. And so um, I would really recommend checking out our website. Um, there's a lot of information about the new Blue Water legislation that you just mentioned, mm -hmm. which is that essentially extends that presumption to veterans who were serving um, in the Navy who potentially didn't set foot on the ground in Vietnam, but were still exposed to Agent Orange. And so um, that just lets lessens the <laughs> burden for veterans to demonstrate because I think Correct. it would be it'd be pretty hard to show that you were exposed to Agent Orange. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> um, and so you mentioned that that's just for CAD or for ischemic heart disease. Right. Um, what about hypertension? So hypertension <clears throat> historically has not been, um, well, historically, it is not currently <laughs> um, one of the presumptive uh, conditions for service connection. Um, however, in 2018, the National Academy of Sciences, which does these um, annual or biannual reviews of, of the evidence <clears throat> linking certain conditions to herbicide exposure um, finally indicated that there was sufficient evidence linking the development of hypertension with Agent Orange exposure. Um, there was a lot of rumblings and a lot of um, communication coming out of VA indicating that hypertension was going to be added as a presumptive condition um, and then that just stalled out. 
um, talks about that are really uh, – we don't really know too much more yeah. about when that's going to be added as a presumptive Hopefully condition. ongoing sometime in the future. <clears throat> um, you know, we certainly hear it next couple of months, next couple of months, um, and it's it's sort of come up in the news again lately. Um, so feel free to mm-hmm. Google that if you're interested to see what's going on lately with the hypertension presumption. Um, but unfortunately, it is not a presumptive condition now. Just because it's not presumptive right. doesn't mean you can't get it service-connected with some medical nexus evidence. Um, and certainly that opinion report from the National Academy of Sciences is very persuasive. So submitting that, um, getting together with your representative, your VSO, um, whoever you work with on your claim um, to either uh, submit that report or um, submitting it to your doctor to look at and mm-hmm. then providing a nexus opinion um, certainly could be a path to getting you service connected for hypertension. Yeah, and I think it's really important um, for example, this National Academies um, report, uh, even though it's fairly well known, uh, the board isn't going to necessarily need to discuss it um, unless you and your representative, you know, submit it and make an argument about why um, it should be considered in support of your claim. Um, there has been some case law recently about, you know, what the board should be. Um, should know about despite it potentially not being in the record and so it's always good to be on the safe side Um, and if you think that there is some medical literature out there that would support your claim um, just you know talk to your your VSO or your attorney about potentially you know submitting that as part of um, your claim and and making potentially an argument about why it should help you in in support of your claim Um, and so that's something to note and so um, studies like the NAS report are really helpful and so um, you know we you can find information on our website about that as well so Courtney we talked about direct service connection we've talked about presumptive service connection but um, is there another way that veterans could potentially get service connected for heart conditions that maybe aren't directly related to service or aren't related to an Agent Orange exposure? Yes, so uh, veterans may be service connected secondary to a condition that they're already service connected for. Um, and I'll give you some examples to kind of provide some context to that. Um, so there's medical literature literature that supports if a veteran is maybe already service connected for a condition like diabetes, it's possible that that diabetes could cause a heart condition or aggravate maybe a a heart condition that the veteran already has. Um, And if you're able to show that through medical evidence, a veteran can also be service-connected for a heart condition that way. Um, Another common example is PTSD or other types of um, anxiety-inducing psychiatric conditions. Um, Literature also supports that there's a connection between those psychiatric conditions and how they might impact or or cause rather um, heart conditions. Um, certain types of medications that you might be taking to treat service-connected conditions could also have possible impacts on your heart condition. Um, so these are all different things that you want to consider if you have a heart condition and you're trying um, to find a way to link it to, or you think it's due to your time in service. It may not be directly due to your time in service, but it may be related to a condition that you have as a result in your, of your time in service. And we've done Facebook Lives and we have a lot of information on our website about secondary service connection and what you need to demonstrate Mm -hmm. in order to, um, you know, meet that standard um, since it is a little bit different than direct service connection. But um, the good thing to know is that you don't necessarily need a heart condition in service. You can, you know, potentially get a a heart condition after service Mm -hmm. related to some other service connected disability. And so um, it's important to kind of talk to your uh, rep and potentially your doctor and kind of explore all different avenues of service connection because just because you can't prove one doesn't necessarily mean you can't get service connected Um, so so those are kind of the different ways that uh, veterans with cardiovascular conditions can um, demonstrate service connection so let's go on and let's just assume that VA has already um, you know acknowledged that a veteran has a service connected heart condition Um, let's talk about kind of ratings so Emma do you want to talk about um, METs or metabolic equivalent <laughs> tests? <laughs> sure. So the um, way that the cardio, the particular heart conditions, um, like I mentioned before, CAD are rated um, is based on a series of tests that a VA examiner most likely will perform. Your private doctor can perform them too. Um, but really, they test just sort of the efficiency and function of your heart. So one <clears throat> big one that is included in most of the diagnostic criteria um, for heart conditions are the METs testing, the metabolic equivalence test. 
otherwise known as exercise testing. So it measures um, the energy cost on your heart for doing different physical activities. And it also measures when in sort of how strenuous of an activity you're doing, um, you start to feel symptoms. <clears throat> um, so if you're walking and you already are out of breath um, and feeling, uh, I can't say this word to save my life, dyspnea, dyspnea? Yeah, dyspnea. Yeah. Essentially shortness of breath. Yes. It's just di- <clears throat> that word. Yeah. yeah. Too many consonants. Well, <laughs> I think that this is really helpful too because, you know, a lot of times veterans are looking at these rating criteria and right. they don't even know what these mm-hmm. things say. Right. Um, and so, you know. Shortness even, of breath. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so you're walking, you're feeling shortness of breath. Obviously, that's going to result in a, um, a low METS rating um, mm-hmm. because at that low level, you're already feeling the symptoms. Um, So what they do is the higher the METS rating, the more efficient, the more functioning your heart is, and the lower your disability rating is going to be. Um, So look at shortness of breath, fatigue, angina, which is heart pain, dizziness, um, fainting, loss of consciousness, um, and then also they consider the medications that you might have to take to maintain maintain your condition. Mm -hmm. I think... um it's really important to kind of, in in cases like this where the rating criteria is pretty objective, mm. um, you know, it requires an examiner to either interview you or do an exercise-based test and then make a determination based on, on those tests what uh, level you're at. It's really important to, you know, talk to your doctor and talk to your uh, rep, um, and, you know, provide evidence about kind of the daily activities mm-hmm. that uh, you struggle with due to your cardiovascular disease. And so, um, Courtney, do you want to kind of talk about, you know, I mentioned earlier a lot of veterans are only rated at 10%, but, you know, there's obviously a broad spectrum. Um, mm-hmm. What are kind of the symptoms that are that VA considers totally disabling? Like, what are the things that it's going to look for um, when veterans are submitting an increased rating claim? Yeah, so similar to what Emma was alluding to, uh, if you are on doing physical activity that's just something like shower, showering or walking one block, Um, or just while you're getting dressed, you're starting to suffer from some of those symptoms. So the shortness of breath, um, the chest pain, the fatigue, those are the kind of things that the veteran, um, excuse me, the VA is gonna look for to say that your heart condition is totally disabling. Um, Chronic congestive heart failure is another thing that VA will consider um, in terms of granting you uh, a total disability rating for your heart condition. Yeah, so anywhere between that spectrum. So if you can walk, let's say a mile or two, but you still feel shortness of breath, maybe that's a 10% rating. But if you really can't do anything without, you know, needing to stop a lot, um, you need help maybe Mm -hmm. dressing or eating or anything like that, um, that's something that VA is going to consider. And so it's really important to uh, tell VA, you know, what what issues you're having and be really upfront. Don't, don't try to minimize any of the experiences that you have because um, you want to make sure that you're getting the compensation. And I think that's really important because sometimes due to the severity of your heart condition, doing an actual METS testing, an actual exercise test is not going to be indicated. Mm-hmm. Um, so they'll do interview-based METS testing and in that interview, they'll ask you what happens after you walk a block, what happens after you, you do X, Y, and Z. Mm-hmm. So it is very important that you are very clear about when you start Start feeling these symptoms because they're just going to be estimating. They're not actually going to make you do the physical exercise because it, again, it might be that you're you know you're at the eighty percent range and they're looking at a hundred percent and it's just not safe to make you start running on a treadmill. Right. Um, so again, if you're in that situation, make sure that you are explaining. Um, how this impacts you in your day-to-day life. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's for uh, cardiovascular (laughs) conditions, heart conditions. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, in the beginning we talked about how there's CAD or ischemic heart disease. They're named the same. They're used interchangeably, which is sometimes a little bit confusing. But then we also have hypertension. And hypertension isn't rated um, based on METS levels. So, Courtney, do you want to talk a little bit about how VA rates hypertension? Sure. It's uh, rated based on your systolic in... uh, diastolic um, readings or pressure so you know we most of us have been to the doctor where they put the little uh, blood pressure cuff on your arm and um, they listen as they blow it up on your arm and they, <laughs> they listen for the two different ticks um, and those two different ticks are indicating where your systolic and your diastolic um, pressure is and usually they'll tell, give you one number over the other the diastolic uh, pressure is the bottom number and the systolic is the top number. Um, So VA uses, again, it's very objective, uses those readings to determine uh, what your rating should be for um, hypertension. Yeah, and I think despite the fact that both 
uh, METS testing and hypertension, read, high blood pressure readings are both objective. Mm-hmm. I think there's that is really hard to kind of use lay statements to Mm -hmm. demonstrate that you meet a higher reading. It's really just based on what that blood pressure uh, reading says. And so, um, unfortunately, there's just, that's just a higher Yeah, I think one thing to keep in mind with hypertension, though, is usually if your hypertension is so severe that it warrants you um, a higher rating for based on VA's rating criteria for hypertension, typically you you also have other medical conditions that have developed from that, including heart conditions, Mm -hmm. which can also develop secondary to hypertension. So while you might not be able to be rated as highly just for hypertension, um, you know, consider what other conditions you have as a result Mm -hmm. of your hypertension because you may be able to get secondary service connected. Service connection and a higher combined rating overall for those. I patients. think that's a really good point, and it's it's VA's duty to kind of make those leaps, um, mm-hmm. the connections between a, a disability and a potential other ratings. Um, you know, it's VA's duty to maximize a veteran's ratings, but um, you know, it's always helpful to to help VA do their job. You know, yeah. make it as easy as possible <laughs> for them to grant you um, the highest possible rating. And so, if you can talk to your rep about that. Um, and kind of, you know, look at at the regs and, and look and see what other potential um, compensation you might be entitled to. Um, it's super easy if you just kind of like give it all to VA and just let them stamp it um, rather than re- relying on them to, to mm-hmm. correctly apply the law. I think one pitfall, just backing up to service connection too, with hypertension that we see is that the um, rating criteria requires that the readings be taken over a series of days. It's not just you had a one-time high blood pressure Mm -hmm. reading, therefore you have hypertension. Um, So a lot of times we'll see folks that have a singular high blood pressure reading in service and then subsequent ratings are maybe normal, but then they end up getting diagnosed with hypertension outside of service. Um, but that doesn't count as a diagnosis for VA purposes. But again, that's not to say that you can't still get service connected by getting some medical evidence, your doctor or your PCP to opine that that first reading was the start of your mm-hmm. hypertension. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's just something to be aware of that, you know, just because you have that one high blood pressure reading, mm-hmm. um, a lot of times we'll see VA explain it away. Oh, they were sick. They were on cold medication. They were stressed out. Subsequent readings were, were lower. Mm-hmm. Um, they do require that it's over several days. So just something to keep in mind. It's not a barrier, but it might be something that you face. So just, just be aware yeah. of that. And I think, yeah, it's really helpful to look and to see what VA actually considers mm-hmm. hypertension mm-hmm. because, um, you know, high blood pressure is kind of a range. You know, certain people are pre-hypertensive versus actually, actually having hypertension. Yeah. And so um, it's important, you know, to keep a – you can – measure your blood pressure yourself you can you know um go i'm sure like cvs still has those um and keep a a journal of Mm -hmm. of what your blood pressure readings are and so that you can make sure that um va is getting a full picture of your actual disability and and you're not getting shortchanged just because you only go to a doctor one day Mm -hmm. um Great. This is really helpful. Um, Just as a reminder, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments box below. We'd love to answer your questions. (laughs) And we know that this is a really complicated um, area of law. The heart, I think, is different than, you know, having a knee problem, like, Mm -hmm. because it's internal. And so um, it lends a little bit of mystery. So Mm -hmm. great. Let's move on. Um, So we've talked about kind of how VA rates um, heart conditions and hypertension now, but VA has actually um, has proposed some changes to how they rate um, heart diseases. And so, Courtney, do you want to kind of give a little overview about what VA is is going to do in the future? Yeah, so the proposed changes are really to make it so that the METS testing is going to be the primary way that they rate heart conditions. So uh, we've alluded to this alluded to this throughout the broadcast, but other things they look at in our part of the criteria are things like a measurement of ejection fraction of the left ventricle um, and then episodes of congestive heart failure. Um, So the proposed changes are proposing to do away with those things, so to take them out of the criteria and really focus on um, the METS testing. They're also proposing to uh, clarify that Dys- Dys- dyspnea. Yeah, dyspnea. I also struggle. Someone can write in the it. comments how you pronounce that. That would be dyspnea. Um, is really referring to breathlessness or shortness yeah. of breath. I think that makes sense because then you won't require people to say, say dyspnea. Yeah. yeah, or look it up because that's not really a common phrase no. for something that is as common as shortness of yeah. breath. So it makes it a little bit clearer. Yes. <laughs> 
Um, so we talked a little bit about, um, you know, how a veteran could potentially get 100% rating under the rating criteria. There are a couple other ways that veterans can get 100% ratings. So, Emma, uh, let's talk a little bit about temporary total ratings. Sure. So, um, if you have, uh, for example, the big one is a heart attack, um, you will be rated at 100% for three months following um, that incident, and then you'll be reevaluated um, based on your METS testing um, and, and seeing how severe the resulting condition is. Um, but for those three months after um, the heart attack, you will get 100% rating. Um, some other ways that you can get a temporary total rating, um, so temporary 100%, um, is if you've had a pacemaker installed um, they'll give that to you for two months following surgery and then re-rate you and see how severe the condition is. Um, there's something else out there now these days called an ICD or ACID, which is an implantable cardiac defibrillator. Um, it's like a pacemaker. It, in the same way, it works the same way in that it senses when your heart is out of rhythm, it's beating too fast or irregularly, and, but it gives you a shock, um, kind of like the full-on defibrillator machines that you might see. Um, in your favorite medical drama, <laughs> but it's implanted um, actually right into your heart. If you have one of those, that is 100% um, rating. The entire um, time. The entire time. So it is important to find out whether you are getting a pacemaker um, or an ICD because that makes a drastic difference in your rating. Um, if you have a heart valve replacement um, while being treated, um, and then six months following that treatment, that replacement, um, you'll then get reevaluated. <clears throat> and then finally, a heart transplant. Um, we'll get 100% for one year yeah. <laughs> and then reevaluated based on your new heart. Um, so hopefully at that point, things are much better. <laughs> yeah. You probably, if things are going well, you won't get a good, get, good, get good a high rating, rating. But you'll have a healthy <laughs> heart, exactly. which is the most important thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then finally, as always, we have to touch a little bit on TDIU. So Courtney, do you want to give us a brief refresher on TDIU? <laughs> Actually, do we have a question? Before we get into TDIU, let's answer this question. So Jose mm. says, would being overweight due to back problems and other issues affect the heart resulting in the in a condition that we can apply for compensation? That is a really excellent question. Um, and I think that it, it kind of relates back to um, secondary service connection. Mm -hmm. So Courtney, do you want to touch on that? Yeah, absolutely. So yes, um, but it will be the short will answer. serve as an intermediate step for that secondary service connection. So if you have a back condition that is already service connected and uh, so disabling um, that it causes you to become obese and that obesity then results in your heart condition. Um, it's that middle step there that then makes the, the obesity is the middle step there that connects your back, service connected back condition and the resulting heart condition. Um, so you can use that to link the two and then get service connection for the heart. Yeah. Also, another way, I mean, this is not exactly the question, but we talked about medications. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're taking medications for the back pain that increase your blood pressure, yeah. Um, or long-term medications, um, long-term steroid treatment could affect it. Mm -hmm. And then also, um, <clears throat> if you um, had an example, and I <laughs> well, if your medication out. use causes weight gain, right? That's, that's what it was. Yeah. If you're taking mm -hmm. medication that, that causes weight gain, mm -hmm. um, that also could be the intermediate step. But yes, obesity can be the link between the two. Yeah. So um, a few years ago, uh, VA and the court had made clear that you know you can't get. A disability rating based on obesity, but um, VA's general counsel has come out and said they recognize that obesity can be the step between mm -hmm. um, a service county disability and another disability. And so um, it's a little unclear kind of how that relates, like what the standard is between the service condition and the obesity, and then what the standard is between the obesity and the <clears throat> secondary condition. Um, and so I think it's really helpful if you're going to be making those types of arguments to consult your rep, either a VSO or an attorney um, and really make sure that they're doing research on um, what VA is going to require to demonstrate that link because it is so there's so many chains uh, links Steps. in the chain yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a really great question yeah Great. So let's go back to TDIU. And I just talked to you, Courtney, so I, I'll go back to Emma. <laughs> <laughs> and Emma can talk a little bit about TDIU. Sure. So yes, you, you, yes, you of course can get TDIU based on a heart condition. Um, and certainly um, heart conditions would impact your ability to do all kinds of work. I and mean, if you're getting out of breath, just showering and getting dressed, 
you certainly aren't going to be able to do any type of physical or strenuous labor, probably not even a desk job necessarily. Getting mm -hmm. to and from work might just be impossible. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but you absolutely can apply for TDIU um, as part of an increased rating. Um, for your service-connected heart condition, um, also and then in conjunction with other conditions that you have. Mm -hmm. um, so as always, TDIU is on the table if your service-connected disabilities prevent you from being able to secure and follow <laughs> a substantially gainful yes. job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we have a lot of information Absolutely. on TDIU and what VA considers when it's determining whether or not a veteran can, um, you know, obtain and maintain a job. Mm -hmm. okay. Do you have any final closing thoughts on IU? I think just uh, oh, on TV or easy, or closing thoughts. In I was general. just going to say a closing thought on the heart conditions in general. Um, I think as you've heard throughout the broadcast, there's many different ways that you can get possibly compensated for your heart condition. Um, so you just want to make sure that if you are suffering from a heart condition, that you really take into consideration all of the different possible avenues. Um, and like you've said a few times, uh, to talk to your rep. Um, or talk to your doctor to see if they can provide medical evidence in support of your case um, because it's not really a one-size-fits-all for uh, mm -hmm. each different case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, going back to that, talking to your doctor, you know, there are there are certain disabilities um, that you can get service-connected for that are really, you are competent as a layperson to describe and to, you know, say that you have a con certain condition but for the heart like i said earlier it is a lot of, it's a little bit more complicated mm -hmm. and so getting um good evidence from your doctor mm -hmm. to support your claim for service connection or your claim for an increased rating um i would really suggest doing that Absolutely. do you have any questions are any closing <laughs> thoughts i have lots of questions um <laughs> no i think that <clears throat> that's a, that's a fair point and like you mentioned the heart's internal it's mm -hmm. not like a knee where you can you know see how far your knee is bending right you it can't is, see like a swelling a right. swollen knee right you can't see like your ejection fraction you can't <laughs> see your meth testing um so while all your lay evidence about your symptoms your breathlessness you know how it impacts your daily life is very valuable at the end of the day, these are a lot of objective <clears throat> medical tests that they're going to perform, mm -hmm. um, and it might really box in your rating. Um, so, you know, don't be disheartened, no pun intended, <laughs> <laughs> but um, <clears throat> just know that, that this criteria is out there, so talking with your doctor is very important. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thanks for joining us, and again, happy Halloween. I hope everyone stays safe, um, and we'll see you next week.